Welcome, welcome, welcome. Let's give ourselves a couple of, not a couple of, a couple of seconds. So we can start uh, around 10.31. Okay, wow, we're getting a nice group of folks. This is typically a much larger group than we have when we have in-person presentations down in Harris. Yeah, exactly. So we're doing pretty well. Good. Okay, Nora, can we start? Yes, we're good to go. Okay, welcome everybody to our winter or fall quarter thesis presentations uh, of those people who have uh, finished or are about to finish uh, in fall quarter. And this is a very exciting time. First of all, just to uh, start out with some thank yous. A big thank you to Nura Yusufa, who uh, has organized all these uh, presentations, both in terms of getting them all on Zoom and everything and organizing the times, et cetera. So thank you so much, Nura, for making this happen. Um, and to a big thanks to all of you um, who are presenting today. Um, a big thanks to the thesis committees who will be um, recognized in each presentation. So, um, as we all know, these theses represent an enormous amount of work uh, for those of you who haven't been involved in them, they uh, were one of the few MPH programs in the country that requires uh, rigorous theses, publishable theses of, of all of our graduates. And it's a big deal. It usually requires one to two quarters worth of work. So, And we're having you do your one to quarter, two quarters worth of work presentations in 10 minutes. So obviously this is a little piece of a huge project. So we're very excited to see all of this. And then a big thanks to all of you who are coming, uh, who have, uh, are coming to uh, both in uh, curiosity and solidarity uh, with our students. So thank you so much. And now we've got some of our MPH staff here. A big uh, thanks to our MPH staff uh, and co-leadership, Deepa, Julie, and I don't know if- uh, Andreas is here. Andreas, are they, there you are down there. Okay, excellent to all of you guys. Okay, so let's start. We have five presentations today. Those five will be uh, Marwa Abdallah, Lillian Pruer, Shorkian Chow, Haley Augustine, and Wenjia Lu. And we're gonna start out with Marwa. Marwa, you're good to go. Um, I can't share my screen over. I just made your comments. Okay. Yeah, thank you. And I just want to add while Marwa is setting up that if you have any questions, which I hope you do, please add them in the chat box throughout the sessions and I'll be reading them um, out loud uh, after the presentation is done. Right. And so there'll be a 10 minute presentation timed and we'll give you the, you know, the two minute warning and then uh, we'll have five minutes for Q&A. Exactly. All right, uh, hello everyone and thank you for being here today. Uh, I'm Marwa Abdullah and I'm presenting my thesis titled Healthcare Provider Communication Styles during an adolescent HIV care training intervention in Kenya. This is a qualitative analysis of training videos. My thesis uh, chair is Pamela Kohler, my and committee members, Christine Bima Sophie, Kate Wilson, and James Pfeiffer. A little bit of a background here. There are 2.1 million, million adolescents living with HIV globally with the highest burden in low and middle income countries. 5% of this population is currently living in Kenya. Uh, large numbers of laws to follow up leads to poor uh, viral suppression and jeopardize the ongoing effort to control the epidemic. This had been partially linked to negative healthcare provider interactions. Uh, WHO quality of care emphasizes a patient-centered care with patient-centered communication as uh, identified as a core component. Patient-centered communication has three major domains, information inquired about and shared, uh, social emotional statements, questions and emotions, in addition to 
uh, power sharing with the ultimate goal of reaching a shared plan uh, of care. This, this thesis has been nested in a stepped wedge randomized control trial named simulated patient encounters to promote early detection and engagement in HIV care. Uh, the study uh, evaluated the use of standardized patients in uh, provide uh, in improving communication competencies in healthcare providers uh, providing services to adolescents and young adults uh, in Kenya. Standardized patients are uh, professional actors. Uh, they are considered a sub substitute to real patients. They have been used since the 1960s and they provide great opportunities for training and uh, evaluation. Uh, my thesis aims were to describe and categorize Kenyan healthcare providers' communication strategies and empathy expression, to compare how providers' uh, communication styles and messages, uh, messaging changes, and to identify key communication strategies that are linked to retention in care. Uh, before moving forward, I want to acknowledge my positionality. Although I'm from and work as a healthcare provider in a low-income country, Sudan, I do not belong to the community where this study uh, was conducted, and I did not participate in the uh, data collection process, uh, and uh, the, the, the data analysis took place here in the U.S. For my method section, the parent study uh, included 24 healthcare facilities, 30 healthcare uh, providers from Nairobi and Western Kenya participated in the first wave of the study. The study had uh, three major components, a didactic training about best practices for adolescent care, and then they, they developed uh, the standardized patient case based on a common uh, adolescent uh, living with HIV challenging scenarios. And then the healthcare providers interviewed the standardized patient and this was a uh, videotaped. Uh, that was followed by a group debriefing. Uh, this figure show my, sam my sampling uh, frame and my sample. Uh, I randomly selected 12 healthcare providers and the, the study team uh, carefully chose four uh, case scripts uh, to reflect uh, variable levels of difficulty. For my data analysis, I use directed content analysis and code counting. Uh, for code book development, it was mostly deductive based on uh, validated uh, patient-centered communication frameworks and guides, in addition to the case, uh, the speed study case scripts and the uh, Kenyan adolescent package of care. Uh, moreover, we added some inductive codes. Uh, we coded the videos directly in Atlas TI without transcription to capture, uh, to capture verbal and nonverbal uh, communication messages. Uh, consensus coding uh, was conducted by two student researchers to ensure consistency with our main focus on describing uh, patient-centered communication behavior and uh, common communication challenges. For my results section, uh, among uh, the 12 healthcare providers, uh, more than uh, female providers were almost double the male, uh, male providers with a mean age of 32 years old. And then uh, I had seven clinical officers, three counselors, and two nurses. Uh, analysis of this, uh, uh, as a result of analysis of this data, three major themes uh, emerged. My first theme, uh, emphasize the importance of uh, investment in report building and less in uh, judgmental behaviors and more empathy expression in uh, uh, ensuring effective social emotional communication. Report building is uh, re a, a reflection of uh, healthcare providers' effort to develop and maintain a positive relationship throughout the interview. Most of the health most of the healthcare providers were uh, were welcoming. Uh, but uh, we, had, we had identified some issues like uh, their temptation to address and counsel about adherence in the beginning of the encounter, which created tension. And some healthcare providers use some uh, like uh, authorization statements. This is a healthcare provider telling the standardized patient. That's why we normally tell you people to take your medication. Uh, in regards to judgment, judgment was expressed verbally, non-verbally, and in many subtle ways. Uh, we, we, we were able to identify many judgment-provoking behaviors, such as 
sexuality, sexual orientation, uh, non-adherence, and even not knowing the names of the drugs. As, for example, this is a standardized patient blaming uh, and the adolescent standard. Uh, this is a, a healthcare provider telling the standardized patient, how do you feel about not knowing the names of your medication in a blame? Uh, and the third uh, area was the empathy expression. Healthcare providers struggled a lot in uh, acknowledging and asking about standardized patients' uh, feelings and even expression, expressing their own emotions. My second theme uh, identified three uh, major areas uh, uh, that was linked to uh, challenging challenges in communication that were mental health, sexuality, and medication-focused interviewing. Uh, with regards to mental health, uh, uh, healthcare providers sometimes ask very uh, hard questions without uh, setting the scene first. For example, this is a healthcare provider asking like an apparently happy and content standardized patient uh, in, in, uh, to screen mental health symptoms. Have you ever thought of killing yourself? And that was awkward. Uh, and then sexuality as well was, was hard to tackle. We either had very insensitive direct questions or very timid and uh, inefficient uh, approaches. Uh, and it was also going hand in hand with judgment. This is a healthcare provider uh, counseling a standardized patient who identified as gay with a, um, with a male sexual partner. Would you mind stopping that and finding a girlfriend instead of your fellow man? Uh, medication focused interviews were just uh, about interrogating the patient about their adherence practices and missing other opportunities. My last theme, uh, identify the, the, the role of ineffective verbal and nonverbal uh, communication on uh, uh, impacting negatively information collection, information sharing, and development of a shared plan. In for, uh, information collection, we, we were able to know more about how they ask questions, the ex excessive use of closed-ended question, and even when they use open-ended question, the standardized patients were not given enough space and time to reply. Uh, there were question, questions that were formulated uh, in uh, like a social desirability way. For example, this is a, standard, a, a healthcare provider asking, you have never missed your medication. You have never, uh, you have consistently used condoms with your girlfriend. For the information sharing, long chunks of one, uh, unidirectional uh, information flow and redundancy was noticed. In addition to the shared plans were mostly about uh, when to come back and the, the adherence and referral to other services. We also noticed that the many, some of them were really flexible and asked about feasibility, but many of them were really authoritative. This is a, a healthcare provider asking the standardized patient who is depressed and using alcohol. I would like you to stop taking alcohol right now in a very parental way. Uh, for my conclusion, we concluded that ongoing support of a healthcare providers on nonverbal and social emotional communication competences is needed. And that qualitative analysis of video data can be useful in identifying specific training gaps and needs. Uh, finally, continuous, uh, uh, continuous effort aiming to improve overall adolescent-friendly service domains would have a larger positive impact on adolescents living with HIV linkage and retention in care. Finally, I want to thank my committee chair and, and committee members for their ongoing guidance and support. My friend and co-coder, Sarah Lawrence, who contributed a lot to this project the SPEED study team and participants, and of course, the Department of Global Health faculty, staff, and colleagues. Thank you. Very nice. Excellent job, Marla. Um, you really did a nice job of putting it all together, and I think made a really strong point that uh, these uh, sessions with standardized patients can be really helpful in figuring out some of the, some of the issues and problems with interviewing. I want to start out with one question and then open it up to everybody else. Uh, my question is, um, you had 30 healthcare providers in 24 facilities, um, but as I understand it, the interviews were only with 12 people. Um, and so my, my question is, what's that relationship? Where did the 12 people come from those, uh, those uh, health facilities? And then secondly, um, 
to what extent do you think you had saturation um, among those 12 uh, or asking another way, is 12 a big enough sample to give you a sense of the, of the breadth of um, issues that might've come up? Thank you, Steve, for this question. So the, the 12 healthcare providers were actually randomly selected from the 30. So I, I believe that they, 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 like, they reflected a very good uh, sample of how they are uh, originally distributed among facilities. And then the cases, when we selected the cases, we, we were very careful about selecting like easy case, medium difficulty case, and really hard cases. So we can capture all the communication domains among those 12 providers. So to answer your second question, yes, I think it, I, I reached the saturation. And by the end of the study, many things were just like repeating itself. And I'm, I'm seeing this over and over again. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Uh, other questions? Yes, so there's a question from Deepa who says, how did you code the nonverbals? So for, for the nonverbals, uh, I used the frameworks. Uh, the, one of them is uh, the RIAS uh, interaction analysis uh, framework. And they, it, they already have their own categories of uh, coding the nonverbals. So we will look at eye contact, if it was there or not there, at least attempting to, uh, to make eye contact with a standardized patient. And then we, we, look at, we looked at the voice tone we looked at the body posture and, and how they use their, the hand movements in expressing themselves. So at least we had uh, five codes that were coded either positive or negative, and they were uh, solely nonverbal communication. Great. And a question from Thank Alex. You. Is there a plan to provide feedback to the HCP, or has it been done? Uh, I think the, the parent study is still under analysis, uh, the quantitative piece of the analysis. And I, I believe they, they could be a plan to share the qualitative results with the study participants as well. Great. Uh, qu question from Kate West, which I think you already um, answered. She said, this is such a complex, complex analysis. I'm interested in hearing more about how you coded the nonverbal cues, particularly the cross-cultural position. Yeah. Are there any other? There's two more minutes. Any other questions, either verbally or chat? Ham Kohler says HCPs got feedback during the debriefing, and then they also got written feedback after the training. Yes. So one question I can ask is, um, now what? Uh, you've done the training. Uh, what happened after the training in terms of using these skills or this experience to you know, either improve training or to help the providers? Uh, I believe adding, adding the specific gaps we identified in the training, uh, maybe to next training processes and then sharing, uh, sharing the training, uh, the qualitative analysis uh, training results with uh, the study participants might have a good role in maybe uh, at least seeing things in a, a different way. Um, yeah. But the training has not yet been rolled out in a, in a broad way throughout Kenya? Uh, I'm not sure, Steve, but I think I think the study, like uh, the training, the training intervention, is now like uh, it took place, and now we're just in the phase for the parent study. They're in the phase on, on training on the uh, data analysis and sharing the results afterwards. Donna Dano has a quick question. Okay. It's a great presentation, Marwa. Thank you. Um, my question relates to how much of um, the training do you think addresses um, gaps um, and, and resolves problems in the context where there are many other things going on that um, are you know, creating an unsupportive environment for health workers? 
and in the study was, were other things done to create a supportive environment for the health workers or was it strictly the training? Um, I believe the study was about the training intervention, uh, but the study had the three different uh, like uh, composites where the didactic training took a place and then the, the, the standardized patient encounter where they got individual feedback from the standardized patients and then they have a big gathering uh, giving uh, like a, a group debriefing about how they felt about the experience. I know a non-supportive environment is, is a, like we can't see training in isolation from the environment and many of the some of the themes that I, I mentioned, especially showing empathy, um, I, what I, I, I hypothesized at the point was sometimes uh, healthcare providers were not trying to ask the questions about how do you feel about this? And then they, they won't be able to offer much support because it's a limited resource setting. So even especially with the empathy expression, I feel it's really linked to how supportive the general environment is uh, is at the at the moment. Yeah, thank you for thank your question, you. Donna. Thanks. Excellent. Very very nice job. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Marwa. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Thanks, Nora. Okay, uh, next uh, Lillian, uh, before Lillian starts, I've noticed that most of the questions are coming from faculty members and we really want to encourage all of you to ask questions, okay? So don't think that this is just a faculty thing. So Lillian. Great, thank you so much. Uh, start the screen share. So thank you so much for the chance to talk about some of my thesis work. My MPH thesis is called Dementia and Good Dementia Care in Denmark, Implications for Danish-Chinese Elder Care Collaboration. I wanna start off by thanking my fabulous MPH committee. I'm working with Dr. Annette Fitzpatrick and Dr. James Pfeiffer, both of whom have been extremely helpful as I've thought about how to take this qualitative anthropological data and really think about it from a public health kind of more applied perspective. I'm a concurrent degree student, so I'm pursuing a PhD in anthropology and an MPH in global health at the same time, which is part of why some of the data collection dates will sound weird for this audience. Um, the data that I mentioned in connection with China was, connect was collected primarily for my dissertation and sort of offers an analytic frame for the public health research, but my public health uh, thesis is really focused on data collected in Denmark. So Denmark and China are two very different places. Um, for me as a white American um, heterosexual cis woman from an upper middle class background, highly educated, entering both these countries as a PhD student, that positionality has really had an impact on both how, how I've entered those spaces and how I've been received there. So I was given the opportunity to start studying Mandarin in high school, travel back and forth repeatedly to China over years to develop cultural and linguistic understanding. Um, once in each of these countries, I think I've had an easier time getting mentorship, getting access. There's kind of a cultural capital that comes with being an American PhD student in my situation. Um, so it's important to me to acknowledge that. I'm also an outsider to both of these cultural settings. Um, and these two countries are really different. So on the surface, they look extremely different. You can see on the map, Denmark has to be circled to really even be seen relative to China. The populations are dramatically different sizes, geographic area, cultural context, um, the amount of financial resources that are available to support healthcare per capita are very different. But in both countries, there's real interest in elder care and aging and how you, the state is responsible for supporting its citizens. And as somebody who was doing research in China at the time, when I started hearing about Danish collaborations with Chinese elder care providers, I was really curious what that might look like. And that sort of became the impetus for this project. So my core question of my public health thesis is really what are the potentials and limitations for elder care collaborations between these two countries? And in order to address that, I think it's important to first think about how dementia and good dementia care are each understood in the Danish setting to think about, well, what implications might that have for any collaborations that continue to develop? Because these collaborations are ongoing. They've been happening since 2013 is the earliest one that I've found, but it's been nearly a decade now of building collaboration. And so trying to kind of lend that critical lens was really the goal here. Methodologically, I collected all of the data related to this project. So I did data collection over a period of five or six weeks in Denmark during 2016. 
and over a period of about 16 months in China, particularly in Sichuan province between 2015 and 2019. These two projects had separate institutional review board authorization from University of Washington. They both used a grounded theory kind of exploratory qualitative approach to really try to build theory from data. Um, they both used interviews and observations, though of course with different levels of cultural understanding and language understanding, I don't speak Danish. So all of that research either had to be done with the help of translators or in English, which was a second language then for my participants. Um, there were very different levels of depth. So in Denmark, I was able to collect 13 interviews and do three days of observation to kind of provide context for those interviews. But in China, I have over 40 hours of recorded interviews. I have um, over 500 hours of observation in institutional dementia care sites. So very different depth, but both using kind of a purposive snowball sampling approach. The data in Denmark was analyzed using Atlas TI and kind of an inductive coding approach to really try to keep the findings as grounded as possible in the data. Um, so I'm going to really gloss over these to try to get to an example at the end, um, but kind of key themes that emerged from the data in Denmark were that dementia was understood in very variable ways. So no two dementias were supposed to be the same. Each patient had to be seen as kind of an individual entity. There was a real sense that the state had a responsibility to provide support, not just to people with dementia, but also to their families. There was an understanding that dementia was related to citizen rights. So a dementia diagnosis did not remove someone's rights as a citizen, and you could still kind of claim ground for particular levels of care based on your rights as a Danish citizen. And that it was stigmatized, but perhaps unnecessarily. So in 2016, there was kind of this pivot happening toward explicit attempts to destigmatize dementia in Denmark. Good dementia care, as a result, was kind of understood as relying on a complex system. So the Danish welfare state has this enormous bureaucracy, and that really meshes with the way that dementia care is approached. Um, it was understood as requiring new forms of communication, especially attention to embodied communication, and as kind of being enhanced by caregiving environments. So really needing to be thoughtful about physical spaces, what kinds of materials can older adults interact with as part of care and requiring professional caregivers and being an ideal that was sort of inherently limited, that you could never fully achieve it and it would be an ongoing project to try and pursue good dementia care. These are kind of very high level themes from the data collected in China, but they're, they were used in the analysis of the Danish data to really think about where overlap might exist. So in China, I found that person-centered care, which was very common in the Danish settings, was not necessarily the ideal for good dementia care. Instead of thinking about patients as sort of isolated individuals, they were understood in what some scholars have called relational care or family-centered care models. Um, and that there were shifting understandings of who was responsible for providing elder care, particularly in terms of a shift between state and family actors, and that that was shaping caregiving decisions. In the Chinese care settings, um, the elder care infrastructure was rapidly changing and that had real impact on what kinds of care expectations existed, both for providers and families. And there were limited resources that provided a challenge for meeting residents' care needs. Uh, so each of, oh, sorry, each of these points could theoretically kind of limit or increase the potential for successful collaboration. Um, I'm gonna give one example here. Uh, Oh, sorry, it's hard for me to read up my screen. So this was a quote from the director of a Danish care facility, and she's describing a challenge that they have there with difficult residents. She said, we have a regulation that says you are not allowed to use any forces. When the residents say no, you cannot do it. But in some specific cases, you can do it. If you have a diaper and you take it with for you can take it with force if a doctor has said, if you don't do it, you will get an infection that will make you die. You should have a permission to use forces. I can hear it when I go out, and she's talking about going out in the hallways of the dementia care institution. Staff talk about residents spitting at them, and it's often when you spit, it's because you cannot use your hands. So where are your hands? Then you have to be curious about the situation. And often the staff have told me that they are holding their hands, which counts as using force, and they have not thought to report it. So in this example, we see somebody grappling with some of these themes, right? Dementia is understood as variable. You have a law that says no force and simultaneously builds in exceptions that, well, maybe this resident's gonna need force. And so we should think about that. You have this very complex bureaucracy kind of surfacing in the background. The idea that care providers are gonna to have to go through channels of authorization. They can't just decide something by themselves. Uh, you have this sense that there's bodily communication is really important, that spitting is communicative, that it's indicating meaningful information about care. Uh, and also that this, there's this ideal that's limited. So 
ideally there would be no force, but in practice, maybe force is happening and needs to be regulated. Um, it's also important that you see the professional caregiver here, both in the leader of the care site walking the halls and literally listening for moments where she might need to intervene and being available to do that work. And thinking about her staff needing to constantly be trained in how they report things, what they're on the lookout for, how they're thinking about their care. Um, so all of that to me is signaling real resource intensive training around education. Um, Three minutes. Thank you. Um, so the potential here is around uh, collaborations for managing difficult residents. So at the main dementia care site where I worked in China, there were a lot of struggles around how to handle residents who didn't want to do something. Whether that got resolved with different forms of restraint or different forms of family involvement, there's a real space for collaboration around experimenting with different models there. Uh, and in limitations, like I was saying with the resource landscapes, um, different degrees of infrastructure for supporting this and different understandings of who has decision-making power. So at the sites where I was in China, family members tended to have the final word, where in this example, we can see it's the doctor. If a clinician says it's okay, then it's okay. Um, so recommendations, um, continued research, I would recommend focus on how family-centered or relational care models might translate into Danish care sites or successfully inform these collaborations in China. To what extent are families' needs and desires comparable between these care sites um, across countries and to partner with local groups to get financial information about what care sites are spending and earning per capita because the amount of investment that these different models require is likely very different uh, and that's data that I personally could not access. Uh, possible collaboration areas could be engaging and supporting family caregivers um, and working to meet the needs of these difficult residents. Certainly the study was limited by small sample size, limited parallel design across field sites, limited time to collect data in Denmark and ability to speak and understand Danish. But there were also strengths. Um, I think that this project offers a more informed starting point for future collaborations and or for evaluating these existing collaborations and kind of ongoing uh, collaborations by raising some of these issues that we should be paying attention to. Um, I wanna thank funding support from various sources, including our Thomas Francis Jr. Global Health Fellowship and Department of Global Health. And thank you all. Yeah, thank you very much, Lillian. That was a very nice presentation, um, very thoughtful, and a topic that uh, we don't hear as much about as I think we should or need to. So that was great. Um, I want to start out with just a, a question about sort of context. Um, you know, China, as you said, China and Denmark are very different. Um, how different are they in terms of the degree to which um, uh, folks with dementia are institutionalized, well, are living in residential facilities uh, versus um, being with families. Um, and uh, to what extent when they are in um, residential or institutional facilities, are the caregivers um, like in the United States, um, low paid and, you know, at, at oftentimes at the, at at lower levels of the sort of social hierarchy. Um, how do you think, you know, how do, how do China and Denmark sort of compare in those aspects and maybe compare to the US and how might that affect the way that people address dementia in those facilities or, yeah. Thank you, those are, thank you for those questions. That's wonderful. Um, so speaking to the degree to which people are in institutions versus family care, it's very different. In Denmark, since the 1960s, there's been a push to create this elder care, institutional elder care infrastructure. And now as funding changes have been kind of shrinking the welfare state budget that's available for that, there's been increased push to have the people who are in institutional care settings be the ones with more advanced dementia. So I, one care provider was saying to me, she thinks it's 80% or more of the people living in institutional care sites have dementia now in Denmark. And so there's kind of this shift that's happening where dementia care moves into institutions. And I think that's part of also the impulse in 2016 when I collected this data, a dementia action plan had just been released. The state was pushing for dementia friendly societies and trying to increase people's ability to stay at home. So you still had home visits, you had people aging in place, but they were just beginning to really push for that kind of 
uh, counterbalance, I guess, to the move to institutions because it's so expensive to have people living in institutional care. And the state was trying to say, well, if the families could do more, if we could keep people at home longer, then we wouldn't have to pay quite so much to have them all in institutions. In China, it's very different. Historically, there's been, people have aged at home for the most part. Um, there was this huge push to build institutions during the time that I was collecting data for this field work. I was speaking with um, policymakers in one province where in 2015, they were building a thousand new elder care facilities that year, um, like from scratch building the infrastructure um, and trying to encourage people to use that as a way to kind of privatize some of the care that was happening. Um, that was also shifting by the end of my field work. So toward the end of my data collection, 2018, 2019, there was likewise this push toward community-based care and interest in particularly NGOs and kind of quasi-state actors offering more elder care and like dementia care support for people at home. Um, once people are in facilities, you're absolutely right, there's low paid, low status workers or can consider to be low paid, low status workers in both places. My experience talking with people in Denmark was that they had comparatively higher pay and higher status relative to the Chinese primary care workers that were in the institutions I studied. Um, in Denmark, there's state supported training. So people could pay, I met one woman where she was being paid by the government for a year to kind of learn how to be a primary care worker, try it on for size, think about whether or not she wanted to pursue this. And there were programs to kind of support people just exploring the career path and trying to kind of give it more social status in that way. In China, there was an attempt to professionalize these primary care workers toward the beginning of my field work, but in 2017, locally in Sichuan, that changed and they began to shift the requirements down in, a ho in the hopes that more people would then apply for the jobs because they were having a hard time maintaining staffing levels. So it was kind of back and forth again, this sense of like change and experimentation in the Chinese elder care landscape was so fast relative to what was happening in Denmark. Um, and, and also I think it's important to nod to the fact that China is an extremely large diverse country and what I was observing in Sichuan would be very different than what I would expect to see somewhere like Shanghai where it's a very high resource city or high resource setting and a more coastal city where it's got more of this international contact to begin with. Um, so both kind of low paid, the impact on care is huge. I think it means that family members sometimes butt heads with the care providers and feel like they can make very strong demands of people without seeing them so much as professionals. Um, so at, for a good example from the primary care site where I worked in China was a family that felt like their mother wasn't getting enough care. And so they literally began sleeping in the facility. They organized their own 24 hour seven care cycle where they would hang out next to their mom all day and like pester her care workers all day to try to make sure that she was getting what they thought she needed. Um, so people are kind of creating their own experiments too to make sure that they're getting whatever level of care they would like to have. Uh, I hope that answers. Thank you, Lillian. Um, you've got several questions in the chat box from uh, or from some folks. So if you have some time to answer the questions, uh, that would be great. Um, but we're at time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Steve, you're on mute. You're muted. Okay. Thank you very much. That was really nice. Um, Shorkeen. Great. Hi, everyone. So my name is Chor Keen. I'll be discussing the prototype development for an advanced patient registry to support collaborative care for common perinatal mental disorders in low and middle income countries. I'd like to thank my thesis committee chair member, uh, Ian Bennett and Pamela Collins. So this is a brief outline. So within low and middle income countries, 20% of women who recently gave birth were affected by common perinatal mental disorders. These are psychiatric disorders that are prevalent during pregnancy and one year after delivery. And the most common disorders are anxiety and depression. <clears throat> and 28% of maternal deaths were attributed to suicide. And that indicates an urgent need for adequate care and assessments for women with these um, disorders. And these following statistics indicate that there's really a major lack of resources to provide um, adequate care. Um, 
But the good news is that there is an existing model that has is evidence based and supports um, healthcare systems. And this model is one that integrates communication and support systems from prenatal staff, which includes midwives, primary care providers, nurses, and also the psychiatric consultants. And as you can see, a mo uh, an essential component of the model is a patient registry. This is used to monitor and manage patients, and that data can be accessed by the key providers. Um, to allow for a weekly systematic case review and um, incorporates input from the mental health specialist. So we really were trying to understand how the collaborative care model could be adapted in low resource settings. So this project uh, was able to gather insight from Nigeria and Vietnam. And in Kantao, Vietnam, um, there is an ongoing um, NIH funded project, Happy Mom, Happy Home, and this is in partnership with Hans Ha University of Medicine and Pharmacy, or C2MP. And the goal is to adapt the collaborative care model for perinatal depression care. And the other site was in um, Ibada, Nigeria, where um, the collaborative care is also being implemented within clinics that are uh, providing antenatal care. And this is in partnership with Ibadan University, and this has been ongoing since 2018. So just a quick note about my positionality. I am not from either of these places. Um, so it definitely impacts the way that I was asking questions and um, analyzing the data. I was um, able to collect data for the use of the registry in Nigeria, and then I coded data that was collected by our colleagues in Vietnam. So um, the registry that I'm talking about, it actually, uh, there's a prototype that was developed based on an existing one developed by the AIM Center and um, it's called the caseload management tracking system, but the prototype was developed on a spreadsheet, which we call um, the patient tracking spreadsheet. And this spreadsheet has actually been used by our partners in Ibadan for the past two years. And um, it will be used in Kantao as the study there continues. Um, so the objectives of the study was really to understand how the registry could be adapted to provide uh, care for common perinatal mental disorders in these uh, low and middle income countries, and also identify the technical design elements um, to help better understand um, how they could be designed and implemented for other contexts that are similar to this. And in a sense, it also uh, allows us to have insight for future iterations as uh, more prototypes continue to be developed. So the methodology we used is a user-centered design framework. It's a design, build, and test framework. Um, this is modified to include the participatory design team, which are involved at every phase um, of this. And uh, really, the benefit of this is that this is used to guide the development of a tool, but it incorporates insight from the community in which it would be implemented. And due to the timeline I had, um, I focused mostly on the discovery and design phases and um, the build and test phases will be ongoing as the project continues. Um, and I also wanted to mention, this is a very iterative model. So um, things will continue to feed back into one another and um, as the tool continues to be developed. So in terms of how data was collected, for the data that um, was collected in uh, Nigeria, we uh, had written structured questionnaires <clears throat> and conducted an online survey to assess the system usability of the prototype and also conducted um, virtual meetings to discuss um, follow-up questions and um, ask any further uh, things in regards to the responses that were given by the questionnaires. So the data was really collected to uh, assess the prototype um, that was being used in the bottom context. And the participants were the primary users of the registry, which included the depression care manager and the psychiatric consultant. Five minutes. <clears throat> Thank you. And in Kantad, uh, there were two semi-structured uh, focus groups and and my structured interviews. And again, this data was collected by our colleagues at C2MP and the participants were commune health center staff and lay health workers. And in this context, they're referred to as collaborators. <clears throat> so 
Uh, the data was managed um, mostly in deduce and um, codes. Inductive coding was used to identify themes regarding the context and essential functionalities of the tool itself. Um, memos and codes were created and then uh, summaries were written, which contributed to the overall analysis that was done. <clears throat> so in the results, in the discover phase, uh, we were able to assess the workflow of um, the team in Ibadan and learned how the registry allowed for different functionalities to flag cases, facilitate discussions, and um, bring in consultations by the psychiatrist. And in the system usability scale, we were um, also um, able to see that the prototype was actually found to be above average in its usability and acceptability by the users. Um, and some of the other um, aspects um, that were highlighted were the challenges, which include some technical difficulties. Um, here, this is a quote from the psychiatric consultant um, talking about the difficulty she had to create uh, follow-up appointments. But other things included, um, there, were a, there was a lack of um, variables about the patient's upset trick information, such as their estimated due date and date of birth. Um, and the users also suggested um, if there was a way to incorporate the registry on a smaller device so it could be more accessible. So in Vietnam, we learned a little bit more about the context there and uh, were able to identify more about the healthcare infrastructure and the different roles of uh, the team members there. And this is a potential workflow since the registry is, hasn't been implemented there yet. This is kind of just a, a map of like potentially what that could look like. Um, <clears throat> minutes. Thank you. And this is the the modified version of the collaborative care model to include the lay health workers. Um, so really we were, we were able to uh, assess the differences in the context of these two settings. Um, we also assessed the use of mobile phones because we wanted to be able to put this on a smartphone as well. So in the design phase, what we were basically doing was taking the things learned from the discover phase and uh, incorporate it into the next iteration, the, the second version of the registry. So we included obstetric data, suicide risk assessment, screening and caseless statistics, um, and remote access and mobile functionalities. So this is just an overview of what I just described. Um, and the key findings, we realized that there's significant value in the DGPT framework to be able to understand the context and use it to inform the next iterations of the prototype. Um, we found the importance of patient-centered care and um, how it needs to be routinely assessed and population-based as well. And also, again, the importance of having obstetric data, having a suicide assessment and a risk management plan in place to support common perinatal depression. So some limitations, it's a fairly small sample size. Um, so we were not able to assess all the factors related to this, but nonetheless, we found a lot of value in it. And the users of the prototype were hired from the uh, university. So they're not workers from the healthcare uh, system, but this will be hopefully addressed in the future as um, uh, potential users will be hired um, that are actually working in the healthcare system itself. So we found that collaborative care supports the healthcare workforce within these settings, um, especially with chronic conditions such as perinatal depression um, through tools like the patient registry. And uh, we gained a lot of insight in ways that the registry could be designed and implemented to fit the needs and the context of the users. And thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Shorkin, that was great. Uh, really nice it's interesting that we have two yet another multi-country study with uh, rather different uh, country examples um, since i said i was encouraging other people to uh, ask questions i don't want to dominate so i will not start with a question and just see if other people have questions all right so we have a question from a student Anita says, thank you for your presentation. I am curious about what makes this approach unique to each country, i.e. how this method supports the country's health system and other LMICs. Uh, thank you for your question, honey. Um, 
<clears throat> I think it's it's uh, it's important the way that they that we use the um, the method to incorporate feedback from the users, um, you know, who will be uh, using the system so that we can actually see what their needs are. And I think that's important to do, um, especially if we're trying to implement a tool that is um, that is not common yet. So um, yeah, we can identify the barriers and it, it's very, um, how do I say, dependent on the, the context. So the fact that um, the study allowed us to assess and get that feedback in order to like incorporate really um, how the tool be used so that it can actually be retained and um, yeah. Great. Deepa says, nice job. I know your focus is on the registry, but might there have been other reasons, i.e. Um, stigma that may be barriers to optimal use of the registry or was this outside the scope of your study? I definitely think there are several other uh, barriers that were not assessed in this study. Um, like I said, because of the small sample size, we couldn't really assess all, all of those factors, but yeah, so it was it was outside of the scope. Great. I think Sheila had a question too, Nora. Oh, um, oh, I'm sorry, Sheila, I missed your question. Okay, thank you for your presentation. I was actually born in Badan. How do you feel, how do you feel like the public and cultural perceptions of mental health, particularly that experienced by new mother, mothers, impact uptake or acceptance of this and similar interventions across the Nigerian healthcare system? Thank you for your question. Um, I feel that, you know, with, with something like um, depression, um, which is, you know, chronic for uh, these mothers, we're trying to uh, create a tool that allows for uh, the providers to really follow up uh, with these patients. And from um, the, the work that was done with our partners, um, we, there were systems in place of um, the depression care manager really checking in on uh, the mothers and, and building that relationship with them. So I think that's a really important part of this. Um, the fact that there's ongoing assessments and um, regular check-ins. And I think that could possibly be a, a factor that helps break down the barriers and um, negative perceptions because the, the focus is on really uh, supporting the mother through these relationships that are more long-term rather than just leaving them. And once they deliver the baby, never following up with them again. Thank you. Shigofa has a question. She says, great job. What kind of online survey did you use for your data collection? So uh, the system usability scale is actually something that's very standardized. Um, and I just created a Google form, honestly, and allowed the participants to just put in their responses that way. Great. I think Hani had a question too. Um, oh, I, I already got Hani's question. Oh, okay, sorry. How are we doing time-wise? Uh, 30 seconds. Okay. A lot of great jobs. Oh, Robbie has a question. Did you notice any barriers unique to the first time mothers who are more likely to have family members present at hospital visits? Um, I'm not sure about that um, because we are mostly talking to the uh, staff. So um, I don't remember that being mentioned in the transcripts, but I do know that um, different staff members have different um, periods of time with, with the mothers. Um, so like, for example, the commune health collaborators um, had more time in the community. And, and so they would have to, you know, spend that time with, with the mother in their household. So I think that they may have some um, barriers for them to properly assess the mom if they're in that home. Great, thank you. So we're at time. Great. Thank you so much, Sharkeen. That was great. All right. I think uh, next up is Haley. Okay, I'm hoping this works. Okay, can you see my we slide? can. You need to get in presentation mode. Okay. 
perfect. Okay. Oop. Oh, okay. I'm trying to like figure out how to have my notes. I'm sorry, guys. I thought I had it figured out. Presenter view. Okay, that's not gonna work, right? Um, I'm sorry. Do you know how to show my, like, so I can see my notes? If you go on, um, on presentation, there's a small bubble on the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. Okay. But you'd have to go on, um, presentation mode first. Uh, so here? So here, at the where there, you have the arrows towards the Department of Global Health. There's a small, oh. yes. yes. No, 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 not the one. The first, yes, that one. You should, should use exactly. Okay, does that work? No. Oh man. I'm not sure you can do it if you have one screen. I think you can do it if you have two screens. I usually use that with one screen though. No. Okay, walk us through it again, please. Okay, so if you, yeah, so go to play. That's go to presentation mode, suites. Then, is it the present? Uh, is it play from current slide? So let me see if I can share my screen. And oh my gosh! Um, it's okay, Haley. Don't worry, because everything's all right. Great. Okay. Uh, okay, so I can't share. Hold on, Lift. I'll I'll make you. If I can find you. I will give you access. Okay, there you go. Okay. So, this is sorry. I had this on. Can okay. you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, so can you see my yeah. cursor? So you have to go on presentation mode first. Let me stop sharing. Okay. So I share now. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, so you go on presentation mode here. Now, can you see my screen? Can you see my cursor? Yes, we can see it. Yeah. There's a, so there's a small bubble here on the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. When you're on presentation mode, you click it, it will show you show presenter view. When you click that, now I have presenter view. Are you seeing my presenter view? Yes. Oh. Well, we don't see your notes. No, no, oh, it's okay. so I can see my notes, but you but are we can't. Yeah. Yes, yeah. but you can't. Yeah. So that's how you do Good. it. Okay. I hope that helps. Okay, you want to try that, Haley? Um, hey. Did you repeat the first? So the first step is to press the presenter mode. Yeah, okay. you go to presenter mode first. You have to share your screen though. We're not share your screen, screen first. There we go. Then you okay. go to pre presenter mode. This presenter? Sorry. No, not that one. At the bottom. Yeah, the, the one at the bottom, no. No, yeah, that one, yes. Yeah. Then, yes. So click on that bubble with three dots. Yeah. Yes, that one. No, 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 that one, yes. And then presenter mode, right? Yes. Okay. Um. So we're still seeing your notes. Is it not working? Sometimes when you don't have the most up-to-date version of the Zoom, it doesn't give you all those functions. Oh. I, I think, I think Haley, I mean, if it's okay with the audience, I think if you'd like to have your notes up, that's fine. We'll just try to focus. 
Uh, yeah, um, I think so too. I'll just email it to myself and read from my phone if that's okay too. Okay. okay. Should we do? Should we? Should we go to the last one and then have come back to you? Yes, we can do that. Is that okay with you, Wenjia, to go next? Um, sure. That's okay. Fine. Okay. So why don't we go thank with Wenjia and then Haley? We can get back to you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So no problem. Right. Wenjia. I, I think we can't hear you, or at least I can't. Hello? Yes. Yes, now we can hear. Okay. Okay. So we should make a special note that when Gia is actually not an MPH student in our program, when Gia is a certificate student in our HIV and STI, um, certificate, which is sunsetting, you know, this this quarter after she presents, she is the last one. So we're really glad to have one. She as part of um, our our schedule for today. So thank you. Excellent. Okay, thank you everyone uh, for being here. Um, I'm Wen Jiao. I'm a doctoral student in nursing science, um, and this is my uh, capstone project of my uh, graduate certificate program in HIV STI. And my pro project mentor is Dr. Carrie Fakor. Um, this project is part of her APL scale of study. Um, this is a qualitative evaluation of the provider acceptability of HIV assisted partner notification services in Western Kenya. So a brief positionality. Um, my background is in nursing. I'm from China and I can speak Chinese and English. I can't speak any local languages in Kenya, so I really appreciate having a colleague in Kenya who did all the data collection, transcription, translation work, and we did the data analysis together. Um, in this project, I was enrolled, I was involved in um, the protocol development, revising the interview guides, facilitating the data collection, and conducting the data analysis. So the sexual partners of HIV positive individuals have a higher risk of HIV infection, but many sexual partners don't know their HIV status or get linkage to care. And studies have shown that um, APS uh, was effective and safe in HIV case finding and linkage to care. And in APS, we find the sexual partners of HIV positive index clients notify them of the potential exposure to HIV and offer HIV testing services to them. APLs has been successfully conducted in Cameroon, um, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, and Kenya. So there are three methods of APLs, uh, provider referral, contract referral, and dual referral. Um, in our main study, most enrolled index clients chose provider referral, uh, where the provider contacted the sexual partners um, with, the, uh, with the consent of the index client while protecting their confidentiality. So we paid a particular attention to provider referral in this study. Um, the aim was to examine the acceptability of APS from the perspective of the service deliverers. Specifically, we explored their experience of doing APS and PR and learn about what they liked and disliked about APS and PR, uh, which is provider referral, and how the contextual factors affected their experience. Um, at the facility level, we used criterion-based purposive sampling. We selected eight facilities based on two criteria. The first is EPS performance, high and low, and the second is patient volume, high and low. At each facility, we recruited one to four providers, which resulted in a total of 14 providers receiving the interviews. And we included those who had received EPS trainings, who had worked on EPS for at least three months, and those who were willing to partic participate in the study. Um, all the interviews were conducted virtually by phone and individually um, in May and June this year. And uh, it was in three languages based on the language preference of the participant. Each interview lasted one to two hours, um, completed by one session or multiple sessions. And all the interviews were audio recorded, transcribed verbatim and translated into English. 
So we had two coders. Um, I was in Seattle and Mercy in Kenya. We did the inductive coding together and conducted thematic analysis in Atlas TI. Um, we found three major themes from the data. The first theme is um, the provider's experience of doing APS and PR. And the most interesting and prominent theme here is that doing APS is a process. Almost all the participants mentioned doing APS is a con continuous, gradual process. It's not a one-day job. Every step in APS required patience, good relationship with the clients, and persistent efforts to, over to overcome the challenges and barriers that may come up. Um, the providers found APS accept acceptable for a couple of reasons. Firstly, it's efficient in HIV case funding and linkage to care. It's not like you go around to do door-to-door -door testing. You have specific targets in mind. And secondly, it helps reach the unreached, especially the males who seldomly um, attend health facilities. And thirdly, it helps the clients know their status, get enrolled in care, initiate antiretroviral therapy as soon as possible, and um, help prevent HIV transmission in the broader population. We also found provider referral particularly particularly acceptable to the providers. Because firstly, in provider referral, the providers contacted the sexual partners on behalf of the index clients, which reduced the index clients' burden of disclosing HIV status to the sexual partners. Secondly, it protected the index clients' confidentiality, which reduced their risk of intimate partner violence or broken relationships. And thirdly, um, providers did the referral independently without um, relying on the engagement of the index client, which makes it more efficient. Five minutes. Okay, thanks. Um, the second theme is the challenges and facilitators of doing provider referral in terms of every step of it. In the first step, part, uh, partner elicitation, the biggest challenge is to have the clients open up to talk about their sexual partners because usually clients need time to accept their HIV positive result and get ready to talk about the sexual partners. It's especially hard to women because um, they fear to be judged for having uh, multiple sexual partners, which is not culturally accepted in Kenya. Um, as to partner tracing, the first challenge is to obtain accurate contact information of the uh, sexual partners from the index client. And sometimes the weather is bad or the distance is long, which makes it hard to reach the sexual partners. And also the cost of uh, phone tracing and physical tracing could be high. When notifying the partners of their exposure to HIV, um, a lot of barriers were from the sexual partners because some of them were suspicious about the provider's intention and didn't cooperate. And some refused to accept any HIV-related services due to stigma. And some clients even behaved very hostile or aggressive, um, which even put the provider's security at risk. Um, after being notified, around 50 to 98% of the sexual partners agreed for HIV testing. And the key to success was to um, build relationship, good relationship with the clients and help them understand the importance of um, knowing HIV status. Third thing is uh, the contextual factors affecting the provider's acceptability. We found a couple of factors. Um, firstly, many participants mentioned doing APS was easier in rural areas because the client's location is relatively stable. Uh, not like in the urban areas, people often move because of the rental um, changes or job changes. And some participants uh, mentioned uh, APS worked better in bigger facilities because um, they have uh, a high patient volume, which makes it easier to find HIV positive cases. And many mentioned they were not satisfied with their salaries and incentives, but they consistent, consistently perceived uh, the trainings and support supervision they had received very helpful, but they need more. Um, and lastly, we found the community awareness to APS has been increased compared to the time when APS was, was just rolled out um, four years ago. Many people didn't know about it. Two and minutes. this increased awareness has um, increased their acceptability to some degree. In conclusion, we found a good provider acceptability of APS. 
We also found provider referral particularly acceptable. We observed an increased community awareness to EPS. And we also found um, the HIV related stigma is still there, which brought um, a lot of barriers to the providers when they do EPS. And we recommend the further scale up of EPS, taking into consideration uh, these identified challenges and facilitators um, to improve EPS delivery. Lastly, I'd like to thank my mentor, Dr. Kari Fakur, and the team members, Dr. Brian Winner, Dr. Beatrice Wamuti, and Mercy, for their contribution in the study design and uh, data analysis, uh, data collection, and uh, thank for their help and support for this project. Um, these are references, and thank you for your attention. I welcome your questions or comments. Thank you very much, Wenjie, for a really wonderful presentation and also dealing with a, a very difficult issue of uh, par partner notification. Uh, let's open it up for some questions from anybody. I'll go. Hey. Hey, Wenjia, since I'm, I'm the capstone person at the moment. Um, I have worked with some groups uh, in Kenya doing APS, and I think one of the biggest challenges we've found is in um, reaching partners who are not the primary partner. So the, you know, the, the second or third partner in addition to a regular partner or partners for, of young people who are not in a committed relationship. Was, but that doesn't seem to have come out much in your um, analysis. So I was just wondering, did the providers have much to say about that? Um, yes, definitely, they had this challenge. Um, usually for the clients, they are more likely to give the, the spouse at the first time. And so they have to, the, the providers had to build a rapport, a trust relationship with the clients and to help them gradually open up to talk about the other sexual partners. So it's not easy. And it's important for them to have a non-judgmental attitude, especially for women, to uh, let them know it's okay to have multiple sexual partners so that they can like open up to talk about the other um, sexual partners. Great. There's a question from Deepa who says, nice job. I wonder what are what are future direction, what, what are the future, what, what are future directions? Has the team thought about how they might intervene on stigma? What are future directions? Has the team, team, thought, team thought about how they might intervene on stigma? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, um, the providers in our interviews, they did uh, identify some strategies to address uh, stigma. Uh, for example, uh, in, in the conversations, uh, the, the, they began like talking about the general life or the other health issues like the um, blood pressure or something like that. And after they build a good relationship, they introduce HIV later and the EPS later. So it's, it's a gradual process. It's not, it's not a one day job. And also they use strategy like um, they pretend to do a door to door testing, but they have the target client in mind. They know who they need to test, but they do door-to-door -door testing so that the uh, the target target clients identify uh, identity will not be disclosed to protect their confidentiality. But those just some some uh, tactics they used. Um, but like the interventions to um, intervene on stigma, maybe there should be more in the future. Okay, great. And a question from Amira, who says, "Great presentation." I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about how about the HIV stigma and how are they addressing it in regards to APS? Oh, I just talked about it uh, not just now. Um, but we believe that uh, with the increase of the community acceptance and awareness to APS, uh, the stigma, like um, the stigma issue will, will not uh, be as significant as previously. Great. So I'm going to wrap these two questions together for time. Gift says, how did you navigate status disclosure, especially with partners of partners? The second question is from Robbie, how is this partner notification ethically seeing how the fallout can be especially can be especially difficult if the one being notified is male and the primary is female? 
who may be socially and economically dependent on, on the males. Okay, I'll first answer the second question to Rabbi. This is a very interesting point, and we do find this from the uh, uh, the clients' interviews. So we had a uh, like separate uh, team uh, working on separate part of that. I'm working on the pro provider acceptability, and some of my colleagues are working on the clients' acceptability. And we do have data uh, regarding the economic, economic dependence of women on men and how that uh, influenced their acceptability of EPS. And th that's, um, that could be reported in the future <laughs> articles or presentations, and you can keep an, on, uh, an eye on that. Um, the first question, how did you navigate status disclosure, especially with partners of partners? Uh, I don't really get it. Gabe, do you want to ask your question out loud? So I'm wondering that someone walks in and they are notified and they have these partners out there who may or may not be aware of their status. So how did you go around that notification for situations like that? So the process is that we have uh, the female index clients came in and we know they are HIV positive. And then we uh, ask the information about their sexual partners and we approach uh, those male partners um, and uh, persuade them to receive HIV testing. And then from those male partners, we further identify uh, the female sexual partner of those male partners and then uh, provide APS to to the partners of the partners. Um, uh, and this closure part, I don't know if I answered your question, but. Uh, yeah, you did. I was just, because it's a convoluted web. So I was just trying to understand how you, you go about that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Wenjia, for dealing with a very, very difficult situation that many, many folks doing HIV work are, are are facing. So very nice. Thank you. Okay, so um, let's get back to Haley. How are we doing, Haley? Okay, I'm going to try again. Okay, um, great. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. I'm hoping that works this time. Yes. Okay. Um, thank you all uh, for bearing with me and <laughs> staying with me. Okay. Um, yad a she Haley Augustine and she told you to nishle how to solve bushes chain, but I need to say adults and Jenny dash another. I'm Haley. I introduce myself in my traditional language. I'm Dine Navajo, and I am from the Bitterwater clan and born for the Meadow People clan. Um, and I, okay, and today I will be presenting on my thesis, um, prevalence, frequency, age at first time usage, and associated factors among American Indian and Alaska Native youth um, using data from the 2019 National Youth Tobacco Survey. Okay. Um, before we begin, I'd like to do a land acknowledgement due to COVID-19 in our virtual environment. I hope you can all reflect on the lands on which you reside and are occupied on. Uh, currently, I'm in Salt Lake City, Utah, just, and I'd like to acknowledge the Goshu, Eastern Shoshone, and Ute peoples of this land where I'm a guest. Um, since I spent two years in Washington um, for the studies of University of Washington, I get there. I also would like to acknowledge the Coast Salish peoples of the land. Um, and the shared waters of all the tribes and bands within the Duwamish, Pialip, Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. Um, I'd also like to state my positionality for this project here. Um, the, the data for this project is secondary data and it's publicly available and I'm an enrolled member of a federally recognized tribe. I speak English and Navajo and I'm a first-generation college graduate. 
Um, I'm on, I'm in the Department of Global Health uh, on the general track. Dr. Sarah Benke Nugent is my thesis committee chair um, and Dr. Rose James of Lummi and Duwamish Nations is my thesis committee member. Okay. Okay. Um, the National Youth Tobacco Survey is taken annually by middle and high school students, often used for design, implementation, and evaluation of tobacco prevention and control programs. However, there are limited information um, published from the data on the AI and AN demographics. Um, poor health outcomes can be correlated not only to health risk behaviors, but also as well as uh, socioeconomic factors, educational levels, and limited access to health care. Um, one in four American Indian and Alaska Native adults live in poverty compared to one in 11 of white adults. Um, American Indians and Alaska Natives are more likely to experience overcrowded households, lower educational attainment, poverty, unemployment, stress, and trauma than any other U.S. communities. Their health disparities are contributed to social and historical determinants of health. The tobacco industry has also been known to use American Indian culture as a marketing ploy. In 2017, there was an estimated um, 5.6 million self-identified as um, American Indian and Alaska Native um, with an estimate of 1.2 million who are under the age of 18, almost 30% of this racial group. And there is an approximately half a million American Indian and Alaska Native youth in the US who have smoked cigarettes during their entire lifetime. Tobacco use is among the two leading causes of death among American Indian and Alaska Native adults with heart disease and cancer. There are many factors needed to be explored in studying the smoking behaviors of this population. This conceptual model is derived from two theories. The first theory is from the overall concept of the social cognitive theory, the idea that suggests that behavioral cognitive and environmental factors happen dynamically and simultaneously. The second image is influenced from the indigenous coping model. And this is woven into the figure shown in blue and purple. The environmental factors include the, the stress and coping determinants. Stress factors include trauma, sociocultural, psychological, and physiological physical factors. The coping determinants include cultural buffers. Um, and then uh, the purple boxes of this model emphasizes health outcomes and includes physical health and mental health and alcohol and substance use. Okay. Um, there are two specific aims for this project. I'll be presenting the data for the first aim today, and I'm currently still working on the statistical analysis for the second aim. The first aim is to determine the prevalence, frequency, and age at first time usage among American Indian and Alaska Native and compare it to all other race and ethnicities um, with the corresponding hypothesis that the prevalence of tobacco usage among American Indian and Alaska Natives will significantly be higher compared to other race and ethnicities. Um, there will be a higher frequency rates of usage and a younger age at first time usage among American Indian and Alaska Natives compared to other race and ethnicities. Um, the second aim is to determine the cofactors of the tobacco usage and frequency of tobacco usage among American Indian and Alaska Natives. Um, the primary cofactors of interest will include demographics, home experiences, and thoughts on tobacco products. Uh, the hypothesis for the aims are listed here, and among the American Indian and Alaska Native youth, there will be more likely younger male and live in urban areas, um, as well as have higher frequency of use among those who live in with a relative in the household who use tobacco, and there will be a higher frequency of usage among those who perceive tobacco product um, to be less harmful and less addictive. Five minutes. This project is an analytic study with quantitative method, uh, methods. Um, participation was fully voluntary. The study focuses on two groups, um, the first being the final student response and the second group being um, the American Indian and Alaska Native students who answered the question to the key variables. Um, there'll be descriptive component with cross tabulation of prevalence and frequency of first time usage. And then there will be a statistical component which includes the dependent variables of prevalence and frequency of tobacco usage in the past 30 days and then independent variables that will show the demographics factors, home experiences and cognitive factors. Um, this slide shows the current tobacco product um, of the usage of in the past 30 days of all race and ethnicities gathered from the data. Um, I decided to make a column on its own for the preliminary and descriptive analysis um, uh, shown 
there to, to uh, kind of not lose data for mis through misclassification. Um, for this slide, I wanted to focus on um, the highlighted amounts. I compared non-Hispanic American Indian and Alaska Native to the non-Hispanic white youth and see that for cigarettes, the AIAN has a significant higher prevalence than that of the non-Hispanic white. Um, as for e-cigarettes, American Indian and Alaska Native and non-Hispanic both share a higher prevalence than that of the national total. And then for cigars, um, AIAN have less prevalence than both um, white and national um, totals. Uh, for this table, I just pulled the frequency of tobacco usage for um, the non-Hispanic American Indian and Alaska Native and the non-Hispanic white. I also included the frequency of usage at the national um, average in the total column to compare it. Um, when looking at this table, the N number of students is the race that should that said yes, that they have tried a tobacco before. And then the zero um, represents the number of days in the column, mean, meaning that they did not use it in the last 30 days. Um, some key takeaways is for all tobacco products, students seem to have used the products more on average of one to five days. Um, and then for, tobacco, for cigarette tobacco use, there seems to be a significantly higher frequency of usage among non-Hispanic American Indian and Alaska Natives than non-Hispanic white. And for e-cigarette use, there is a higher frequency of usage among AIN, but um, non-Hispanic white seem to have used cigarettes on more days. Um, as for looking at the usage of cigars, uh, the AIAN youth use less overall compared to their white counterparts, but those that do use cigars, cigars use them more frequently. Few minutes. Uh, this table uh, shows the age of first time usage among non-Hispanic American Indian and Alaska Native compared to non-Hispanic white. Um, the age at first time usage is split into categories of school level. Uh, this shows that data for e-cigarettes and e-cigarettes. The highlighted portions of the table were the highest um, percentage of students age at first time usage of the products are. I think the key takeaway is that there's significant portions of students trying their first cigarette and first uh, in elementary. Um, and then non-Hispanic whites seem to try cigarettes and e-cigarettes later in high school, as opposed to the American Indian and Alaska Native who try cigarettes and e-cigarettes early. This makes it difficult to understand though, um, because the survey is taken um, during middle and high school. So it can be hard to differentiate um, that. And then the strengths of this project is that there is potential to fill in gaps in the research and tell a broader story um, or details that are added to the narrative about the American Indian and Alaska Native demographic um, demographic, and it um, also helps on, sets a foundation for future questions. Um, the data could include, uh, so for the limitation, the data could include a recall and response bias, and they may not um, come to a conclusive determined relationship between associations of variables and outcomes. Um, and also the survey is not a culturally attuned, um, and there could be um, some obscurities in misclassification. Um, okay, so this slide is the wrong slide, um, but the implications of the study is um, is hitting on some keynotes that, um, sorry, I'm just looking at my notes, is that, uh, that it seems like there's the white youth and um, kind of use at similar rates as the AI and youth on some of the, uh, the data. And so that could, uh, that could um, kind of troubles the stereotypes that there are about American Indians and Alaska Natives. Um, also, when looking at the data, the, um, the end numbers are so small. So when doing the statistical analysis, I'm going to think about um, maybe having to um, put some of them together to do, um, which will cause misclassification also. Um, and then also um, just looking at the, filling in the gaps, um, that could also help structure for uh, future um, projects and prevention programs for this uh, demographic. Um, and I think I'd like to thank my uh, thesis chair committee and then the staff at UIHI who's helped me and mentored me and then also my advisors at UW and then my colleagues at, um, in, the, in, the, uh, in my cohort who've also helped me with this project. Um, any questions? All right, thank you so much. That was really nice, very nicely done. And um, I think you really did a great job of um, presenting a uh, very serious and troublesome uh, situation, you know, with uh, uh, with the populations that you're talking about. So let's open it up to questions. Um, 
think, I don't know how much time we have. We're getting close to noon. So just a couple of questions, I think. One question I have, if we don't have one just right off, is um, you noted at the beginning that the tobacco industry had a particular focus on um, Native American and uh, Alaska Native communities. And um, I'm just curious as to it, you know, showing that there's so much usage in middle school um, and even elementary, but middle school and high school. Um, is there actually promotion at that level? And you know, to what extent uh, is that a problem that needs to be addressed? Um, yeah, I mentioned um, that there was, um, there could be a correlation to that. That's also one thing I was thinking about when thinking about my cofactors, um, because there are questions on the survey that specifically ask about um, their exposure and what, um, and how they receive it. So if I wanted to do um, that particular part of the data, I could also look at it. I just kind of figured that it would be, I kind of wanted to get a baseline um, of knowing specific demographic and cognitive factors, um, but that definitely is a scope that would be very interesting and kind of what um, actually made me interested in this project in the first place. All right, yeah. thank you. Uh, there's a question from Deepa who says, nice job on such a needed topic. What is the future direction of the work? What will, what will this be used for? Um, yeah, so there are actually a number of projects right now um, happening at um, all different levels in different states um, that speci that's specific on tobacco product uses, especially within AIAN community. So I'm hoping that maybe I could um, keep working on this and then with the outcomes of it, maybe get it published. Um, if not, just having it a resource um, and kind of just, um, especially at the local, I think when I was working at UIHI, they were doing a lot of different work and different projects that were surrounding um, I guess, substance use. And then I, I'm really actually curious to see if it could also correlate and help look at the usage of marijuana, um, just because I know that's also being, um, is also the prevalence of that is actually gonna go up also um, across the United States as it becomes more legalized. Um, and I'm also like one, I definitely wanna maybe get this published also because um, um, just because it's pre-COVID, right before pre-COVID. And so I'd like to see and think about, um, I think it's important to, to think about the youth, um, especially during these times of um, uncertainty. Okay. So I'm gonna wrap these two questions together. Okay. Um, so Nina says, uh, why do you think cigarettes were the, why do you think cigarettes were the most widely used compared to other tobacco products? And Robbie says, could low cigar use be signaling towards the economic in inequality between racial groups? Um, yeah, so I actually decided to use cigar um, in the study because it was actually the third most prevalent um, of the different tobacco products in the survey um, at the bigger uh, national scope. So I thought that was important to see how they look at in comparison. I'd also am interested in finding out like the in economic inequities. Um, there's no questions about it um, in the survey. Um, so it would be hard to kind of distinguish it between the two, but um, kind of just like looking at the conceptual model, how everything is also attributed to these um, factors of usage and the behavior. So um, I mean, it could be, um, but I wouldn't know from the data alone. Um, and then Nina's question, why cigarettes were mostly compared. Um, it could also, again, have to do with the, the different factors of that, or it also, also tying it into Steve's question, it could also tie into like the marketing um, that they have for this demographic and um, this um, American Indian and Alaska Native um, population. Great. Thank you so much, Haley. I think we're at time now, or a little over time. So I want to thank, uh, all of you presenters for really, you know, uh, giving us not just great presentations, but insights into really important stuff. Um, and uh, I must say in this last hour and a half, I learned a lot. I wanna thank all of you for attending. Uh, a particular thanks as well to the thesis committees, uh, the thesis chairs and the committees of all of you students. Uh, that it's, uh, it's a big job and uh, it's very much appreciated all the effort you put in. 
And then finally, a big thanks to Nora and the MPH team. Take care. Have a great afternoon. Thank you, Dora. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.